Welcome to your weekly UAS news update. This is week 71. And this week I got some really good topics. The first one is the FAA that's adding a bunch of airports to Lance. The second one is a company that's creating a security camera that is actually a flying drone. Uh, you've probably seen it in the news. Um, I want to talk about AUVSI that published a letter to the FAA to tell them to uh, quote, quote, hold fast with remote ID. And in there, there's actually a really interesting nugget that I want to talk about. And then the last one is going to be Skydio that partners with Eagle View. And this is actually not so great news, I think, for the drone community, but we'll talk about that. So let's get started. So the first thing this week is a great news. And uh, I shared this with my students and a lot of them were excited because the FAA published new uh, airports with Lens. So Lens is now deployed at 133 new airports. That makes the total 726 airports. And a lot of my students that have been in the past asking, when is this gonna happen? Well, it's here, it's happened. So now 80% of the controlled airspace under 400 feet is now available in Lens, which is really, really good news. Uh, in my area, south, uh, close to Phoenix, there's a whole bunch of new airports that have been added. So this is actually really, really good news. So um, you can see the whole list, there's a link down here for the Facebook post that the FAA made. And, uh, and then you can see kind of all the different airports that are in there. You can also go to the UAS facility map and you can see uh, the list near you. You can type an airport name and then uh, get directly and see if it's green, then it's good. If it's red, it means it's still not part of Lance and you have to use the FAA drone zone. But again, this is really good news. The next thing was this, I, somebody sent this to me, uh, actually my business partner sent this to me, and we kind of scratched our head and said, is this actually a real thing? Uh, and this is Ring, the company that uh, does the, the bell that has the window, the little uh, screen in it. They released this drone that can actually fly inside of your house autonomously when you're not at home. So the, the concept is that if somebody opens a window uh, when you're gone and uh, the, the security system senses it, then it can send this drone automatically to go and see what's going on with the, uh, well, who, whoever is coming in into your house unattended. Now it's fully autonomous, uh, but you have to build a map of your house so that it knows where to go. Uh, it has sensors, it has prop guards on it so that it doesn't hurt anyone. It's fairly small from the look of it. Uh, it's going to be available starting next year, $249 to $149. It's called Always Home Cam. And the idea behind this, I was listening to an interview from the, the founder of this company, and uh, the idea is the fact that they didn't want to have cameras everywhere around the house, so they just designed a camera that can move around the house. So I, <laughs> I can think of so many scenarios of a uh, pretty funny thing that this thing can record and uh, anyone living in that house losing a whole lot of privacy all of a sudden because somebody decides they're gonna fly the drone around and go uh, check on people. So anyway, uh, you can see the link down here. Let me, t let me know what you think about this. I'm just gonna giggle at it, but um, so let me know. Let me know what, what you think. The next thing is kind of a serious thing. Uh, this is AUVSI. Now, AUVSI is the Association for Unmanned Vehicle System International, and they published a letter this week, and I think this came kind of uh, uh, timely after the, the letter that I talked about last week, the letter from the uh, AMA, the EAA, from AOPA, a bunch of A's in here. Uh, the, the, these, this group I reported last week uh, published a letter to the FA asking them to reconsider remote ID proposal, the NPRM, and saying, well, this is going to be a bit of a mess, so you need to change things. And, and we all know that the FA has made kind of the final ruling at the moment, and they're getting ready to release in December. Now, AUVSI published this letter, and is they're urging the DOT to continue to support the FA to publish the final ruling, and quote-unquote, without any further delay. Here's a quote from the article from the letter, actually. It says, we urge the department to support a final ruling that sets performance requirements rather than specifying particular solutions for remote ID compliance. Now, I kind of agree with this, actually. Um, I agree with the fact that we should have just a general solution instead of very specific uh, things that we need to do. They go on in here to say that they've made comment on the NPRM, like a lot of other people, to request minor changes. Now, personally, I did not request minor changes. I requested major changes. In and you guys saw this information when it came out. Uh, but uh, they requested minor changes and none of them 
would be enough to trigger a supplemental NPRM. So then I started scratching my head and I said, what is a supplemental NPRM? I had actually never heard this term. I talked to a bunch of people that are pretty close to regulation and they hadn't heard this term either. So I did some research and I found out that a supplemental NPRM is an actual process that is a legal process that is possible when there is an NPRM situation. Now, let me kind of back up a little bit. NPRM, Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. When an agency out there wants to create a rule, then they go through the NPRM process, they present it to the public, the public has a certain amount of time to make a comment, the FAA, or the, the, whatever agency, the FAA in this case, collects these uh, comments, reads them, supposedly, and then responds to the comments in the final ruling. Interestingly, there is an additional process that is optional but available that's called a supplemental NPRM in which after the NPRM is published, after the agency receives the comments, if they make substantial changes, and this is a quote in here, when an agency has made significant substantive changes to a rule, then we can have a supplemental NPRM as an additional step before the final ruling. So this would come between the NPRM and the final ruling. Basically the FA would review this proposal and then submit a supplemental NPRM with major changes that they made to the regulation. People can comment again and then there would be a final ruling. So I'm, I'm just kind of wondering to myself, why is this language in the AUVSI uh, letter? Is there someone out there that's uh, floating the idea that there should be a supplemental NPRM for the remote ID NPRM? And if that's the case, then I find that really interesting uh, because this would mean that the FA is making, is making changes that are substantive enough that we could have a, um, a supplemental NPRM. Now, I don't have any concrete proof other than this letter right here from uh, AUVSI talking about this. I, I don't have any proof that the FA is actually looking into this, but, but you know, like they say, if there's smoke, there's fire somewhere. So if somebody is mentioning this term, which a lot of people are not familiar with, then there's probably a reason. So. Anyway, I'm not going to really go into more detail or, or start rumors. This is definitely not what I want to do, but I wanted to educate you on this process because, well, I learned something, so I figured I would share it with you guys and, uh, and explain what it does. So tell me what you think. Tell me, you know, this is all speculation at this level, but, um, but this actually I think would be interesting if the FAA and other agencies that are working on the, on the remote ID had some sense they would realize that this is something that is extremely controversial. And I think they realize that this is something that's extremely controversial with the, uh, with the industry, the industry at the commercial level, but also the industry at the hobbyist level. And, uh, and if they wanted to do some goodwill with the community and with the industry in general, then if this is something that's available, a supplemental NPRM would actually make sense to me so that there is another way for the public to share their opinion about what the FA is expected to do. So um, I'm not gonna get my hopes up, probably not gonna happen, but uh, it's interesting to know that this is something that is actually available. Okay, enough on this. Um, let's talk about Skydio. Skydio is partnering with Eagle View. And I read the article several times because I really wanted to know uh, what I was going to talk about in this uh, news update, but Skydio announced that they will partner with Eagle View. Now, Eagle View is this company that uh, collects data, okay? Uh, quite frankly, I'm not 100. I, I know I know what they do to a certain extent. I don't know to what extent this uh, kind of uh, goes, how far this actually goes into what they do. But for example, if you work with drone base, so if you work for uh, other drone aggregators, they work with Eagle View. If you go through drone base, for example, and you get the training, you get the training from Eagle View to capture uh, real estate photography, to capture a commercial real estate photography, and a bunch of other things. This is all kind of done by this. Uh, third-party eagle view. Now, the uh, interesting part in here is they say that this partnership here, quote, is a part of a multi-year, multi-million dollar exclusive partnership. And what they're going to do is Skydio is going to provide their Skydio house scan software in order to complete autonomous property inspections. What this means is that Skydio is providing the software so that autonomously mean automatically, somebody can go and scan houses for a whole bunch of different uh, outfits. You're talking about insurance agencies, you're talking about, um, well, a lot, of, a lot of things that require house inspections. Um, 
the, the problem that I have with this at, at this level is the fact that this is autonomous, that has AI, and basically is just taking the pilot out of the picture. So for you and I and other people that fly drones for a living, this basically means this portion of the market going away to some autonomous flight. Now, I'm not saying that you're not gonna go there and then put the drone down and then take off, but what, what are you gonna get paid in order to push a button to go up and just basically complete a mission that's autonomous? And at one point, the drone is just gonna be sent over there beyond visual line of sight, collect the data, and then come back, and then there's no more pilot. So um, it's good news, I'm sure, for Eagle View and Skydio. I don't know that it's really good news, quite frankly, for the, uh, the middleman operator and the average Joe that's gonna be flying a drone for a living. So uh, a little bit sad, but, uh, if you think that the current aggregators don't pay a whole lot of money, then wait until this happens, and then basically the pay is gonna go down to nothing because it requires absolutely no training. Just push a button and then let the drone do the thing. So um, a little bit of a sad day, I think, uh, personally. From I like flying, I like hand flying. Uh, I love drones and I love what they do, but uh, I also love the fact that this provides jobs for American people and, um, and, and this is not. So anyways. Last piece is an update on Pilot Institute. We just hit 7,000 followers on uh, on YouTube, so I'm excited. We're growing pretty steady on this. And then uh, I attended a conference this week called Hashtag Elevate that was actually geared towards men aircraft pilots. And I'm talking twice. I'm talking again today. Today is Wednesday. And, um, and I talked earlier this week on Monday about the state of the UAS industry. And this was interesting because usually when I'm invited to talk or when I talk to uh, different groups, I talk to UAS pilots. Here I was actually talking to men aircraft pilots, which I'm one of them. I, I understand this whole industry. And um, and it was just interesting to share information about the UAS industry. Now, as a, as a goal with creating Pilot Institute and and create and getting involved in the UAS industry for me was always to bridge the gap between manned aircraft pilots and unmanned aircraft pilots. And I see a lot of um, animosity, I guess you can call it, or I see a lot of of uh, a big gap, quite frankly, between the two industries. And I don't think that there is a reason for it. And uh, and I think it, a lot of it is a big misunderstanding from the manned aircraft. Uh, community that has been established for a while and sees drones as a threat, as a safety risk, quite frankly, uh, just because they don't want to see a drone in the airspace when they fly and then hitting it, which is a legitimate concern. I'm concerned about this myself if I fly uh, an airplane. So, uh, so my goal was to always kind of try to bridge the gap between the two communities, and this was a great opportunity for me to educate the main aircraft community and give them information about the UAS industry, what it's doing, and I spent I spent an hour talking pretty much about all the different opportunities out there to use drones for good. And I talked about all the different industries that use drones, how they use drones. And I think it was very well received, lots of great comments at the end. So um, just wanna keep you updated on what I do uh, on the side when I don't teach, when I don't record classes, when I don't record this. Uh, this is a big part of what I like to do, which is uh, spread the word, whether it is on, on one side of the industry or on the other side. So. With that said, um, that's it. That's all I have. You guys have a great weekend and I will see you next week.